Welcome, friends. Uh, before we get into the video, I want to say firstly, if you hear any noises, it's my upstairs neighbor. Um, but I have a few other things to say. I promise it'll be short and sweet. Uh, first, thank you again for your patience with the videos. I'll be moving house mid March, but I'm in the process of slowly moving my office and studio right now. So this doesn't keep happening, the noise. Uh, so things are a little chaotic. This will be my ninth move in four years, but it will be uh, more permanent. So there's that. Um, I'm determined to get back to a regular upload schedule after my vacation vacation next week. I miss you guys. I miss telling the stories of the missing, those unjustly taken from the world, and the forgotten. Second thing, I have decided to extend the Wendigo cameo tees, mugs, and sweatshirt availability to the end of January because you guys have been loving them a lot. I get like three or four tweets a day of you guys wearing the product, so that's cool. So if you haven't gotten yours yet, be sure to grab those before the month is up. I'm currently wearing mine. It's dirty and dank because I haven't taken it off in four days because it's warm and I'm cold. Um, to those who have purchased, thank you for that and for that matter for your support this entire past year. Um, you guys have really blown me away. We went from 100,000 to 300,000 subscribers, which is insane. Um, I am so grateful for every one of you, so thank you for that. Third, the music in this episode was all composed by my talented friends at CK Productions. They did a wonderful job and they have a SoundCloud and a YouTube page where they have royalty-free tracks for all of you creators out there. So over the next week or so, there will be a bunch more uploaded to their channels. So if you guys like the music in this episode, want to use it for your own project or are looking for another excellent source of royalty-free music. All you have to do is credit them in your description and provide a link to their YouTube profile. Go subscribe to CK Productions. They're amazing. And if you've listened to this whole intro, thank you, but now on to what really matters. Difficult circumstances, marital, financial, occupational, never dampened two fathers' fierce love for their children, and for the daughter living through it all, her light never dimmed. Then they all vanished. On a Sunday in February 1999, Lorenzo Chivers, his boss Paul Skiba, and Paul's daughter Sarah Skiba disappeared, leaving behind blood and little hope. Today on Dark Matters, the disappearance of Lorenzo Chivers, Paul Skiba, and Sarah Skiba. The son of a police officer in Plymouth, Minnesota, Paul Skiba was the town troublemaker in his youth, but his antics paled in comparison to a fierce loyalty to his friends, kindness to strangers, and a sense of humor to win almost anyone over. He had a knack for faces and names, and because of this, according to his friend Jerry Bybee, he was my best friend, but I wasn't necessarily his. He knew hundreds of people and Paul was there for them during trying times. When Bob Martinez's alcohol addiction was getting out of hand, his wife knew Paul could get through to him. The Martinez's were so grateful to their friend that they named their son after him. When Rich Lesmeister lost his wife to cancer, Paul helped watch Rich's kids, even though he had his own family to care for. But to Paul, friends were family. Even though he was known as responsible, he continued to have run-ins with the law into adulthood. After a misdemeanor drug charge and skipping court, Paul, around 20 years old, moved to Denver, Colorado with his girlfriend, using the alias Craig Nelson. The couple settled in a two-bedroom apartment in Westminster, where Paul flourished, going to concerts, skiing, and enjoying the outdoors. Unfortunately, his past eventually caught up to him. Paul was arrested for skipping court and had a string of misdemeanors after. In 1988, he pled guilty to a false reporting charge in Boulder, Colorado. Two years later, he was charged with harassment and pled guilty to disorderly conduct in Jefferson County. In 1991, he faced a menacing charge in Douglas County and was on probation for two years. 
Then, in 1993, he was charged with harassment and later that same year, disorderly conduct in Douglas County again. The nature of these charges are unknown. We do know that Paul changed jobs several times over the years and that his love life was about to change. After making baby buggies and installing sprinklers, Paul found his way to the moving company Student Movers in Westminster, where he met Michelle Russell. At the time, both were dating other people, but after their respective relationships ended, the two became an item. Soon, they moved in together, married, and on July 27, 1989, they welcomed a baby girl, Sarah Ariel Skiba, into their family. Sarah Skiba, an only child, was the light of her parents' lives. Vibrant, loving, empathetic, nicknamed Missy and Peanut, and a chatterbox, Sarah had a distinct personality from an early age. Michelle told Nancy Grace, Sarah sang as soon as she got up each morning, as well as at the dinner table. Sarah's interests were vast. She loved dancing, watching movies, taking care of babies and animals, and making those around her laugh. During neighborhood barbecues, she played hostess and brought guests their drinks. She also shared her father's love of the outdoors, swimming, skiing, snowboarding, hiking, biking, and rollerblading the streets when the weather allowed. And Paul loved Sarah more than anything. Bob Martinez told Denver Westward, Paul and Sarah were beautiful together. They were like a Hallmark card. Sarah was Paul's whole world. He'd do anything he could for that girl. Sarah was always happy, full of spunk. Unfortunately, the love between her mother and father was fading. Paul confided in his mother, Sharon Skiba, about his marital troubles since she'd recently divorced from Paul's father in 1990. He convinced her to move out to Colorado and helped with her housing, moving into an apartment with her in Castle Rock, and eventually to a house Paul purchased in Thornton when things with Michelle were looking bad. The divorce came swiftly in 1993, but the proceedings were long and bitter. Michelle got custody of Sarah, but Paul fought hard for visitation, which was granted on Wednesdays, every other weekend, and during summers. Michelle and Sarah lived in Granby, Colorado, 90 miles west from Paul's home, but he never missed a visit. Sharon Skiba helped take care of her granddaughter on weekends, taking her bargain hunting on Saturdays. On Wednesdays, Paul and Sarah swam, fished, or went tubing in Fraser. On Thursday mornings, Paul dropped her off at school. The separation from his daughter was difficult, but in her absences, Paul focused on work. Paul became co-owner of Student Movers with his cousin, Herbert Himes, when the previous owner retired and they bought the company. In 1998, Paul bought out Herbert and renamed the company Tough Movers. The business thrived under Paul's ownership. His clients were Denver luminaries and sports stars who trusted him to be firm but fair, and his employees became like family. Paul took everyone camping once a year where he cooked for them and smoked marijuana around the fire. Bob Martinez told Denver Westward, Paul would give you the shirt off of his back. That's how he was with his employees. He hired some shady folks, but it was because they needed help, they needed work. He just treated people great. It was through his employee Jerry that Paul met Teresa Donovan. After meeting at a Halloween party, Teresa and Paul began dating, but the relationship was anything but stable. They were on and off for over two years. A decade younger, Teresa suffered from arthritis in her legs and couldn't work as a result. Teresa often stayed with Paul and Sharon for weeks at a time, and according to Sharon, she never helped around the house and stayed in bed when Paul had company. She told Denver Westward, I hated my son being with her, because I wanted to see someone more suitable. I didn't like her around Sarah. Because Sharon and Teresa didn't get along, Paul rented a trailer for Teresa. Through Teresa, Paul met Lorenzo Chivers, who lived with Teresa's sister, Bobby Joe. It's unclear if Bobby Joe and Lorenzo were in a relationship, but they were living together. At the time, Lorenzo was looking for work, and Paul offered him a job with Tough Movers. 
Lorenzo wasn't among the shady crowd that Paul hired, though. An easy conversationalist, friends and family described Lorenzo as nice, mellow, and a devoted father of two, 12-year-old Aubrey and 15-year-old Josh. Though he and his estranged wife, Misha Chivers, weren't together anymore, they remained close for the sake of their children and talked about reconciling. He always left his kids with an I love you and no doubt in their minds that it was true. In 1998, after Paul and Teresa break up again, things turn sour. Teresa tells Paul she's pregnant, and Paul suspected the child wasn't his, but didn't feel Teresa could properly care for a child, so he moved her back in with him and his mother. The baby, named Paul Roger Skiba, was born around November, but after that, things only grew more tumultuous. On February 7, 1999, while in Minnesota taking care of her mother's funeral, Sharon expected a call from Paul, but never heard from him. The next day, Teresa told Sharon Paul took Sarah to work the day before, and neither had returned yet. She said she just knew something terrible happened to Paul. Lorenzo's family experienced similar anxiety when he didn't return from work either. At the onset of February, Paul complained about Teresa to friends over dinner. He said when he returned from work, she was usually still in bed. Other times he'd come home to find her partying with the neighbor, leaving Sarah just nine to take care of the infant. Paul had enough. He planned to legally seek a paternity test, kick Teresa out, and sue for full custody if Paul Roger was, in fact, his child. February 5th, 1999. Sarah runs to the school bus stop early in the morning and slips on a patch of ice. Michelle, who dropped her off, gave her a band-aid. It was Paul's weekend to have Sarah, so he would pick her up from school at 3.30. She drove away, not knowing it was the last time she would see her daughter. February 6th, 1999. Jerry, a friend and employee, asked Paul to watch his son, Matthew, while he went to work. Later, when Jerry picked up his son, Matthew claimed he and Sarah played outside most of the day to avoid Paul and Teresa's constant arguing. Jerry asked Paul for Sunday off, and he volunteers to cover for him, thinking he'll just take Sarah to work with him. February 7th, 1999. Sunday morning, Paul's partner for the day called in, so Paul asked Lorenzo Chivers to cover for their two jobs that day. Paul, Sarah, and Lorenzo met at the Tough Movers lot in Westminster, where the moving trucks were secured nightly by a chain-link fence and a lock. After finishing their moving job in Littleton, they drove to their final job in Morrison. Sergeant Pat Long of the Thornton Police Office claimed all three were seen leaving their last job around 5 to 5.30 p.m. Presumably on the way back to the Westminster lot, Sarah called an unnamed 12-year-old relative of Teresa's, saying they'd be back shortly. That night, Sharon Skiba never heard from her son, and Bobby Joe, Teresa's sister, and Lorenzo's son, Josh, wait up, but Lorenzo never comes home. Around 5 p.m., when Paul hadn't returned Sarah to her mother, Michelle called his phone once every hour, almost all night, but no one ever answered. Worried, she called Thornton police to make a missing persons report, but authorities insisted she had to wait 24 hours before one could be filed. And it's a long wait. February 8th, 1999, Monday. At the Tough Movers lot, Jerry arrived late for his shift around 9.30 to 10 a.m., only to find the lot secured with a new lock. This only happened after Paul fired someone, but Jerry also noticed the moving truck Paul used the day before was parked crooked and was nose in instead of backed in, something Paul was anal about. Jerry's boss never showed up, and there's no sign of Sarah or Lorenzo either. In Granby, a panicked Michelle replayed recent conversations with Paul in her head. She told him she might be moving to Oregon, and Paul said things that made Michelle think he might try and take her. Michelle filed a custodial complaint, and a warrant was issued for Paul's arrest. 
Teresa reached out to Michelle, asking if she'd seen Paul, but neither woman had. She then calls Sharon Skiba and says she thinks something bad has happened to Paul. Josh, Lorenzo's son, calls his mother, Misha, and says his father never came home last night. Bobby Joe, Teresa's sister, says she has a feeling Lorenzo won't be coming home. 24 hours past the last time Lorenzo, Paul, and Sarah were seen, authorities hadn't started investigating, despite multiple calls from Michelle, Teresa, and Sharon, who was told by authorities that Paul probably took Sarah for a ride and they'd be back soon, so they shouldn't worry. This didn't explain Lorenzo's absence, and Misha was equally worried. Tuesday, authorities still refused to investigate. Wednesday, the Grant County Sheriff issues the official warrant for Paul's arrest, but only after pleading does Jerry get an officer to meet him at the Tough Movers lot. Upon finding out there was no key to enter the lot, the officer rammed his patrol car into the fence before climbing over. Jerry follows and moves a large piece of plywood to reveal an oil spill beneath. The officer says, Can you prove that he didn't change his oil? To Jerry's frustration, the officer leaves, saying no crime was committed, even though he hardly glanced around. Thursday, Misha takes Josh to Lorenzo and Bobby Joe's to pick up some of Josh's clothes. On the front steps, they find the contents of Josh's entire room packed up, waiting outside. No note, no explanation. Misha said to her son, I guess you don't have a room at daddy's house anymore. It seemed Bobby Joe packed Josh's items up shortly after Lorenzo went missing, and after saying she didn't think Lorenzo would be coming home. On Saturday, February 13th, 1999, Sharon arrives back in Colorado, worried sick. She knows Paul would never just up and leave his family, business, and friends, especially at the risk of losing visitation rights. But police still refuse to investigate, so Sharon takes matters into her own hands. Teresa phones Paul's friend Rich Lesmeister and his wife Carol for help, and after handing out flyers all morning, Rich, Carol, and Sharon meet at the Tough Movers lot to investigate. Rich and Carol jump the fence, and they also notice the new lock and the odd way the truck is parked. Rich sees the Tough Mover's second moving vehicle, which recently had an engine malfunction. Paul asked Rich to rebuild the engine for it, but Rich had yet to install it. After Rich and Carol move the piece of plywood leaning against the non-functioning truck, they see the same oil stain Jerry spotted days earlier, but notice something the officer didn't. Two bullet holes in the side of the truck and shell casings on the ground. The functioning truck used by Paul the day he disappeared had a blood smear near the truck's doors, but the back of the truck, where Paul kept his blankets and other moving supplies, was unusually spotless and the supplies were missing. In one of the truck's cabs, it's unclear which, there was more blood smears found. Then, Carol and Rich see something that chills them. A piece of scalp on the hood of the truck and hair stuck to the fender. They return to Sharon and call the police, telling them they found a crime scene. Sharon's whole world changed upon seeing the scalp and hair. She told the Denver Post, When I saw that, I knew my son was dead. It was horrifying. However, the police still weren't convinced anything was amiss. Officers threaten gathering friends and family with criminal charges if they don't leave, as they claim no crime was committed there. They argued the blood could have been from a cut, the bullet holes the result of a shooting elsewhere, despite the truck with the bullet holes not having an engine. The argument between worried family and friends and unconcerned law enforcement continues past sundown. Eventually, they decide Thornton PD will take over the case, and at 3 a.m., relatives and friends leave the lot. Law enforcement stays to wait for the towing service to haul the moving trucks into evidence. Sharon asks Thornton PD to lock the lot after they leave, but she finds it the next morning unsecured and no crime tape to indicate anything is amiss. 
Local news catches wind of the disappearances and airs the story as a possible abduction related to a custody battle. When the public is just learning of the missing trio, family and friends are out searching. Driving along every street, scouring every business and residential parking lot within several miles, canvassing neighborhoods, checking in open fields, culverts, large sewer pipes, and construction sites. Michelle Russell conducted air, water, land, and door-to-door -door searches for her daughter and ex. Two days after the searching began, they find Lorenzo's gray Chevy Chevelle in the Lakeview Apartments parking lot in Westminster. The inside is clean and fingerprint free. Over a week later, Denver authorities locate Paul's light blue Kia in an apartment complex lot in Denver. His normally immaculate car is muddied on the outside, but spotless on the inside, save for a backpack full of Sarah's Beanie Babies. As far as Thornton PD can tell, there's no connection to the apartment complexes where their cars were found, and they're back to square one. The Colorado Bureau of Investigation, CBI for short, joins the case, and three weeks after their disappearance, homicide detectives are assigned to the case and examine the evidence from the tough mover's lot, or lack of. The functioning truck's loading ramp, moving straps, and blankets were absent from the vehicle, just as family and friends had pointed out earlier, and police speculated the ramp might have had incriminating evidence on it. There was also no evidence of Lorenzo Chivers in the trucks or the lot, but authorities felt he was also in danger. Vegetation in the truck's radiator indicated it was driven near a body of water recently. More concerning, though, was the DNA test results from the crime scene. The blood on the truck's door spattered on the ground, and the piece of scalp belonged to Paul Skiba. Blood outside the truck pooled beneath the oil spill, and the hair stuck to the fender was Sarah Skiba's. Investigators theorized the oil was intentionally spilled over Sarah's bloodstain in an attempt to conceal it. The amount of blood told detectives both Sarah and Paul Skiba were likely fatally wounded. Though authorities talked to over 80 people, only a few witnesses saw a large truck leave the Tough Movers lot between 7 and 9 p.m. based on different accounts. All accounts agreed the truck returned around midnight, and the trio were never seen again. Authorities thought Paul, Sarah, and Lorenzo were ambushed in the lot, their bodies driven hours away and dumped, possibly in a lake or river. The trio's status changed to endangered missing, and foul play was suspected in their disappearances. Paul's arrest warrant was canceled, but no arrests were made and no named suspects. Lake dredges and area searches turned up nothing. In a desperate plea for information, the families of homicide victims and missing persons and Crime Stoppers offered $8,500 for information on the trio's disappearance. No one came forward. Sharon Skiba tries to ensure Tough Movers doesn't go under in case Paul is alive and returns. She asks the authorities for the moving trucks back after police collect evidence. Authorities return them, but the scalp, blood, and hair are still attached to the trucks. CBI takes the evidence back and uses luminol, which the family had requested they do days earlier, and they find more blood on the back of the truck and in the cab. At home, Sharon, Teresa, and the baby, Paul Roger, are living in chaos. Friends and family from both sides visit and offer comfort. Sharon's friends overheard Teresa and her mother sifting through Paul's possessions, discussing his $100,000 life insurance policy he had on Sarah and who would take over Tough Movers. Sharon was appointed temporary conservator of Paul's estate in order to continue paying his bills and running his business. Teresa argued that she should have that power instead and took Sharon to court. When Teresa moved out of Paul's home in March, Sharon changed the locks. The Adams County Probate Court told Teresa in order to be granted conservator of Paul's estate, she had to prove they were married. Paul's friends testified he had no intention of marrying her, and Paul had filed single on his taxes, and Teresa's request was denied. Sharon continued her duties over Paul's estate, 
but now had to pay Teresa child support for Paul Roger in addition to keeping his business afloat. The case grows colder over the years and hearts grow heavy and staying afloat starts to feel like drowning. The families have their theories about what happened to their loved ones. Lorenzo's ex, Misha, hasn't publicly commented, but Sharon is almost certain Paul, Lorenzo, and Sarah were ambushed upon returning the truck to the lot. In her opinion, it was a crime committed by someone who knew Paul. Michelle Russell's confusion has only grown over the years. It makes no sense to me. If it's money, if it's revenge, if it's any of those things, my child was innocent. But not all believe every party in the missing trio was innocent. Theory number one. Lorenzo was involved in the ambush and injury to Paul and Sarah Skiba and went into hiding. Local media first pointed the finger at Lorenzo after learning his DNA was absent from the lot. Misha Chivers begged the media to remember her ex was a human being just the same as Sarah and Paul, saying... He was always either a suspect or he was just a third party or just an employee. Misha and Josh met with Thornton PD's Sergeant Pat Long, who tells her they believe Lorenzo was a victim as well. Which brings us to law enforcement's theory, that Paul used tough movers as a front for a narcotics operation and ran into dangerous people. Sergeant Pat Long told Nancy Grace Paul wasn't by any means a, quote, major drug lord, but he had a small clientele he sold marijuana to. They believe multiple people were responsible and knew Paul's movements throughout that day. Sarah and Lorenzo happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Authorities even think it's possible Lorenzo was forced to help dispose of the bodies and was killed elsewhere, and hence his DNA's absence from the lot and why he is still missing. Long said, In my opinion, I believe we know or we have a strong feeling who was involved in the murders. Paul's friends and family aren't so sure about the attack being drug-related. No one denied Paul's marijuana use, but everyone was adamant he never partook around Sarah and never would have put his daughter in any sort of danger. Sharon Skiba claims law enforcement later told her they no longer believed the attack was drug-motivated, but it's unknown who she spoke to or what current authorities at Westminster PD believe. Theory number three. Teresa Donovan was directly related to what happened to Paul, Sarah, and Lorenzo that day, and was possibly financially or emotionally motivated. Several people reported Paul and Teresa were arguing in the months leading up to the disappearance. In January, while driving his mother to the airport, Paul confessed he planned to file legal papers for a paternity test for Paul Roger, that he was breaking up with Teresa, and if he was the father, he would fight for full custody. Then, according to Denver Westward, Friday, February 5th, two days before Paul and Sarah vanished, Paul called Sharon, saying he told Teresa he wants her out of the house by Sunday night. He promised to call Sharon the evening of the 7th. Then, his friend's son sees Paul arguing with Teresa the day before he goes missing. A family member heard a loud argument that ended in Paul telling Teresa to leave. A witness later came forward and claimed they heard a woman screaming near the Tough Movers lot the night of the 7th. Paul's friend, Jerry, spoke to Teresa on Monday, who confessed she'd gone to the lot the night Paul disappeared, and she asked Jerry not to tell the police. It's unknown if he did or not. Teresa claims those responsible for the disappearances are still free. On the Montel Williams show, she said the act was one of revenge against Paul that Sarah and Lorenzo were in the wrong place, the wrong time. During an MSNBC special, she said Paul recently rented out parking spaces to several people and later had the cars towed. She said, They sold Paul drugs, and they were the only people that could have killed him. I don't know if it was over the cars or anger over Paul trying to get over the coke. This is the only mention I encountered about cocaine, so I can't confirm its validity. Still, some think Teresa was innocent. Paul had many friends, but some say he had a few enemies, too. Ones that wanted revenge. One of those people was Herbert Himes. 
Himes, Paul's cousin and former co-owner of Tough Movers, allegedly held a grudge against his former employer. After serving six years for aggravated robbery in the late 1980s, Himes attempted to go back to Tough Movers, but Paul cut him out, claiming he caught him stealing money from the business. Rich said that Himes vowed revenge and speculates that it might have been Himes' truck seen leaving the lot the night of the 7th, not Paul's. He said, Nobody knows for sure. What better way to transport the bodies and his car across town than to drive it in the back of another moving truck? Himes denies this, saying he quit the business because his money in stocks was earning him more. Which leads us to Paul's next enemy, Teresa's brother, Tom Donovan. Tom previously worked for Tough Movers, but was fired a few months prior to Paul vanishing and held a grudge against his sister's boyfriend. Post-disappearance, Tom reportedly threatened Paul's friend, Jerry, yelling, You're next, while throwing rocks at the Tough Movers truck. Sharon claims Tom called and said he was glad Paul was dead, that he and Sarah were shot in the head, and that he was going to shoot Sharon next. Then he took Sharon and Jerry to court, claiming they owed him money. Bob Martinez witnessed Tom make a gun gesture, then motioned like he was going to shoot Sharon. The Donovan family all refuse to comment on the case now. Some believe it's possible that Teresa and her brother were both directly involved, but it's difficult to say for sure that this was premeditated since neither Paul, Sarah, or Lorenzo were supposed to work that day, and all the shift changes were last minute. Regardless of what we think happened, we still don't know, and for family, that has been the most painful part of all. For Lorenzo Chivers, Paul and Sarah Skiba, and their families and loved ones, answers are still few and far between. Westminster PD spokesperson Sherry Spotkey told the Denver Post, Detectives are hoping that in the past 15 years the burden of carrying Sarah's death has been too much for the killer and that he or she has told someone. At this point, police are looking for any information or detail that could help lead the police to where their bodies were dumped. Police hope that someone knows even the smallest piece of information that could help lead to catching the killers while bringing peace to a family that lost a child so young in life. But for family, waiting wasn't so simple. Though Misha Chivers met with Thornton PD once a month about the case, developments never came. Josh and Aubrey grew up without answers about what happened to their devoted father, and the pain extended generations, as Lorenzo's mother never gave up looking for answers until her death in 2005. Teresa Donovan sent paternity tests to Sharon after moving to Idaho, which showed that Paul was the father of Paul Roger, though Sharon remained skeptical of the results, not wanting to get her hopes up that a part of her son might live on in another grandchild, especially after she'd already lost one. And life for Sharon only got harder. All while grieving, speaking with media to keep the case alive, hoping for updates, paying off Paul's two mortgages, paying child support to Teresa, and trying to keep Tough Movers up and running, eventually the money ran out. Tough Movers went under in 2000, and in 2001, Sharon was out of money. In 2002, after a car accident that left her with broken ribs, a dislocated collarbone, and a herniated disc in her back, she couldn't work. So she sold Paul's house in May of 2007, and the court gave $65,000 of the house sale and $100,000 from the life insurance policy Paul had to Paul Roger Skiba, Teresa and Paul's son. Even though Sharon spent years trying to do right by Paul and his estate, the court thought Sharon should have been paying Paul rent for living in his house. They deducted the amount they thought she should have paid him, leaving her with only enough money in her account to pay for her own burial. For the rest of her life, she stayed with friends in Colorado, broke, unable to work, and with her son and granddaughter presumably murdered, until she passed away in the holiday season of 2013. 
As for Michelle Russell, she continues to look for answers about her ex and her missing daughter, and the Chivers continue to hope for answers. She told Nancy Grace, Someone took her away from me unjustly. I'm not going to sleep until I know why. She raised $50,000 in reward money for information about the case and told HLN-TV, There is at least one person, if not many people, who have information. Three people were murdered, so there must be. Sarah Skiba was nine, four feet five inches tall, 80 pounds, had blonde hair often worn in a ponytail, hazel eyes, and a red mark across the bridge of her nose. Paul Skiba was a white male with brown hair, blue eyes, and he may have had a mustache, beard, or goatee. He'd used the alias Craig Michael Nelson before, was 38 years old, 6 feet 1 inch, and 170 pounds. Lorenzo Chivers was a black male, 36 years old, 5 feet 10 inches, 160 pounds, had black hair and brown eyes, possibly had a mustache, beard, or goatee. Foul play is suspected, and all are missing and presumed dead. They are listed as missing and endangered, but authorities are investigating them as homicides. If you have any information on the disappearance of Paul Skiba, Sarah Skiba, and Lorenzo Chivers, please contact the Westminster Police Department at 303-430-2400, extension number 4225. Special thanks to the Patreon family. The names you see on screen are just some of the people who financially contribute to this channel, whether they are passionate about cases like Sarah, Paul, and Lorenzo's, or the other dark content on this channel, their support cannot be overstated. If you are interested in supporting the channel, information is in the description, but even if you only continue to support by watching, thank you. Thank you for giving Sarah, Paul, and Lorenzo's case a moment of your time, and my heart goes out to their family and friends. They've gone too long without answers, and we all hope for justice someday so that closure can begin. Special thanks to crime reporter Kirk Mitchell at the Denver Post and Jessica Centers at Denver Westward for their detailed reporting on this. This case didn't receive much media attention for some reason, and their articles are the reason I have so much info to put out there to all of you. And no matter what you choose to believe or what you speculate, I ask you only for respect in the comments below. And remember, though these may be dark matters, the darkness always matters. Go subscribe to CK Productions YouTube channel or SoundCloud for royalty-free music, and don't forget to pick up some Wendigo merch before the end of January. And thank you for your continued support and attention to these cases, and for receiving them openly and respectfully. Stay safe, friends, and have a good night. <laughs>